Should necrophilia and incest be legalized? The young liberals of Sweden say this should indeed be the case. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Okay, so the liberal youth of Sweden is now keen on incest and necrophilia. Aftonbladet titles the liberal youth allow incest and necrophilia. And goes like this. The liberal youth organization in Stockholm, the LUF, wants to make incest and necrophilia legal. So it was decided at its annual meeting today. We are a youth organization and one of our tasks is to think one step further, says Cecilia Jonsson, LUF president in Stockholm. The proposal, presented at the Youth League's annual meeting today, says that siblings over 15 years of age should be legally allowed to have consensual sex with each other. We do not generally think about moral laws and this law protects no one right now. We are a youth organization and one of our tasks is to think one step further. I understand that it can be considered uh, unusual and disgusting, but the law can, uh, cannot assume that it is disgusting, says Cecilia Jonsson, LUF president in Stockholm. Meanwhile, the Youth League made a decision that it should also permit a form of necrophilia. Essentially, individuals should be allowed to donate their bodies after their dead for sexual purposes, if they so choose. You should get to decide what happens to your body after you die, and if it happens to be that one wants to donate his body to the museum or research, or if you want to donate it to someone to sleep with it, then it should be okay, uh, adds Cecilia Jonsson. Adam Alfredson, spokesperson for the Liberal Party, says that these proposals are nothing like the Mother Party in nothing like the positions that the Mother Party endorses. Incest is and should remain illegal. We reject the Liberal Youth Stockholm's proposals. There should be no change in the legislation. The reporter asks, do you imagine to be legally able to donate your body to necrophilia? We think it will continue to be legal to use a dead man's body in such a way, added Adam Alfredson. Now this is interesting. To have a more comprehensive image from where this is coming from, take a look at the logo of the organization. I don't think you need to speak Swedish to understand it. Okay, frihet means freedom. The other two really don't need any sort of translation. So, the freedom-loving, anti-racist feminists want the legal prerogative of having sex with grandma and continue to do so after her death if grandma like it, likes it so much during her lifetime and allows that in the afterlife. I know it sounds brutal, but that's essentially the gist of their proposal. Again, I'm working with the customer's material here. But let me treat these two proposals a little bit more seriously, and I'll explain at the end why I treat them seriously. So please, hear me out. Now, there is a point to be made that not uh, everything immoral needs to be illegal. Just like not everything is illegal, not, 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 not everything that is legal needs to be moral. As such, the argument goes in this case that legalizing incest does not mean you have to engage in it. Now you see, that's all fine and dandy until we start thinking that the reasons incest is forbidden. Reasons that have nothing to do uh, with any sort of morality. For starters, the entire body of law, not just in Sweden, but everywhere, from Uganda to Iceland and from Indonesia to Bolivia and everything in between, is based on the natural family. And central to this is the concept of kinship. Many countries, Sweden included, even have separate provisions that apply to members of the family depending on the degree of kinship between individuals. Now, admittedly, this uh, uh, way of organizing things is far from perfect, but it maintains an order of the descendants which is very useful when it comes to things like inheritance, but also useful when looking for potential donors in cases of medical emergencies. That's why, for instance, paternity fraud is such a huge deal, in addition to being an emotional trauma. So given this, how do you judge 
legally speaking, a case where the mother is both mother and grandmother? Serious question. By the same token, how do you judge a case where the father is both the father and, let's say, an uncle? And in two or three generations, you will have cases where the mother is simultaneously mother, aunt, and cousin. Now what? If a member of such a family sues for inheritance, how do you untangle all of that? Again, this is a serious question. Now, of course, one could argue that the law shouldn't manage these kinds of situations at all, and the inheritance should be based on a will or a testament, and not legal kinship or blood kinship. All fine and dandy, but we don't live in that world, but in this world, where these things matter quite a lot. In addition to that, there's also the medical argument. A child born out of an incestuous relationship is much more likely to suffer from all sorts of diseases. Repeated incestuous breeding comes with guaranteed, almost guaranteed trouble. Now, that would be immoral in and of itself, but there's an additional problem to that. In the case of Sweden and most of Europe, the medical problems stemming from incest are everyone's business, by the virtue of the widespread application of one of the worst ideas imaginable, namely socialized healthcare. Now, as it comes to the arguments in favor of legalizing incest, there's the case of Daniel Heaney and Nick Cameron in Britain, brother and sister who were separated at birth and adopted. They met as adults and found out way into their relationship that they are, in fact, siblings. The law didn't exactly care and they were sentenced to probation, which included forced separation. And they didn't exactly care either. Such a case is not unique at all. A South African pair, for instance, found out just when they were about to get married that they are brother and sister. Same story. Separated at birth, had no way of knowing, la 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 la. Oh, and the South Africans already had a child on the way. In Brazil, a married couple found out on the radio that they were siblings as they were both looking for their mothers who had abandoned them as babies. Much to their shock, they were looking for the exact same woman. Now, I could go on with more examples like this, but you get the point. Such people are indeed not protected at all from incest being illegal as they could not possibly know that they were committing a crime. On the other hand, there's cases like the case of Patrick Stubnig, uh, who had four children with his sister in Germany. One of them, the only healthy child of this relationship, still lives with the couple today. After serving around four years of jail combined from, different, from three different convictions of incest, Patrick Stubing underwent voluntary vasectomy. This is the kind of case that illustrates why incest should indeed be illegal because the three genetically degenerate ki children that this relationship has produced have needlessly burdened the German society. Two of the Stubing children suffer from severe uh, physical and menti mental disabilities and another one was born with a heart condition that required a heart transplant. Now, all these three disabled children were placed... Uh, in foster care, which means they were a constant drain on the German taxpayer. Again, these kinds of cases are not rare either. Now, have the right-thinking, anti-racist, feminist liberals considered all these aspects? Of course not, because, you see, that's hard work. Speaking of hard work, a definitive case study on this can be made in France, where incest has been legalized over 200 years ago in 1810. Same goes for Belgium and Luxembourg. Now, that's the kind of hard work I am not willing to do. Not now, anyway. Okay, let's quickly get through the other proposal, necrophilia, because I don't want to make this video too long. Now, the Swedish liberal youth says that they would only approve if the dead person somehow consented during the lifetime of using the body for such degenerate purposes. Fair enough, but in the case of necrophilia, there is an even stronger argument to keep it illegal because it inflicts externalities upon surrounding unsuspecting people even faster. You see, dead bodies have this tendency of decomposing. Now, I don't want to get into the gross details, but it's simply not feasible to keep a dead body in your house for long periods of time. Not without proper tools, anyway. 
And for the purposes of necrophilia, it becomes an even more complicated task, strictly from a technical standpoint. The comparison to donating one's body to science is also inappropriate, to say the least, because the conditions of a laboratory which conducts studies on a body or harvests uh, healthy organs for transplants are not, in any way, shape or form, comparable to the conditions of a regular property where a newly empowered sexual deviant would want to consume the newly legalized deviancy. Not only the ethics of the purposes are different, but the actual technicalities are indeed completely different. As such, the comparison is one of an apples and orange kind of type. Now, why have I chosen to treat these freaks' proposals seriously instead of just calling them degenerates and call it a day? Well, the answer is quite simple. Because such requests are bound to increase in the near future, not decrease. I know, I know, I don't like it either, but if this comes uh, uh, right from the heart of Scandinavian feminism, then expect to see more of this in the very near future. Historically speaking, nearly every single stupidity concocted by Swedish feminists in particular has, co has become a talking point in the wider European and North American left within a matter of years. Take the Swedish feminism position on prostitution, which in 1980 was rightfully regarded as a wacky stupidity even by other feminists. Today, the Swedish feminism's position on prostitution is the law of the land in Sweden, Iceland, Ireland, Canada, portions of the United States, France, and many, many other places. That's why tracking the Swedish feminist establishment is very important, and especially the youth leagues, which will soon be taking over the helm. God help us. On the incest point, the number of cases like those I presented, with people finding out way into their relationship that they are, in fact, siblings, are indeed bound to increase anyway. Even if, ten years from now, we somehow get to turn around the tide in the cultural war, there are still several generations of abandoned children separated at birth. This will especially be a problem in countries like Germany, Britain and Sweden, countries which have progressively made child abandonment by mothers easier whilst maintaining strict laws against incest. One of the reasons this will happen is because of a well-documented phenomenon called genetic attraction syndrome or genetic sexual attraction, which manifests particularly between siblings who have been separated at birth and they again meet as adults, although cases of GAS between offspring and mother have also been documented, though to a far lesser extent. You see, under normal circumstances of children actually living together with their biological parents, siblings, particularly brothers and sisters, tend to develop an underlying repulsion to each other, which serves as natural shield against propensity towards incestuous relationships. But, if they're separated at birth or while still in their diapers, that bonding no longer forms and, as such, there is no protection later on. In other words, such cases and the upcoming increase in the rate of such cases is another result of the increased easiness with which women are allowed to abandon their children under the guise of empowerment and women's rights. Nevertheless, this is, a not, this is not a joking matter. These people who have fallen and will fall prey to the genetic attraction syndrome are victims of abuse by their parents and the state, not perpetrators of a crime. Understanding this is the first step towards helping them because the good news is that GAS can be alleviated in most cases, thus preventing the furthering of the cycle of abuse by giving birth to children resulted from incest. In other words, I treated this seriously because, unlike the anti-racist feminists, I actually researched the topic instead of thinking about it from a purely hedonistic perspective. Anyway, I will approach some other controversial topics like these when given the chance, because going hard light on everything may be good morals, but it rarely makes sound policy. Just like going free for all on everything may feel good, but it rarely makes for sound public policy. Anyway. With that being said, thank you for watching and uh, yeah, please do tell me in the comment section below what you think. I'm interested more in the incest topic and a lot less in the necrophilia one. I mean, I think I think we can all agree that necrophilia proposal is not feasible at all in addition to being absolute degeneracy. So yeah, anyway, I'll see you around.
Yeah. I'll play them alternative.